This one kind of kind of smells. Is that oil? Is that oil I smell on that? Don't ask me, Red. I lost my sense of smell for oil when I worked on that offshore rig. You worked on one of them oil rigs? Oil well, things are huge, aren't they? Eight and a half trillion tons. <laughs> really? Trillion? And we weren't drilling for oil. We were drilling for gunpowder. <laughs> Might be a little dangerous, wouldn't it, huh? Drilling for gunpowder. Well, the water helps, and it's under a lot of pressure. This was a deep part of the ocean. I'd say maybe, oh, 20,000 leagues under the sea. <laughs> That's deep. Yeah, well, they will figure it out. A league is over six feet. Right? No, that's a that's a fathom. <laughs> Red. A league is a metric fathom. <laughs> Be sure about that, Hap. I never heard that before. <laughs> anyway, one day I was running the drill. We had maybe twenty-one thousand leagues of pipe going straight down, and I hit the mother load, pure gunpowder, <laughs> and she blew. Boom. Not completely, but big. That pipe blew straight up. 21,000 leagues of pipe shot straight up and out into space. Traveling even 15 times the speed of sound, it took nine minutes for the end of that pipe to pass by me. <laughs> Noisy? You wouldn't believe the racket. After that, gunpowder mining was declared unsafe. Where'd the pipeline come down? Mars. <laughs> Nothing personal happened, uh... I'm having a real problem believing this story. It doesn't bother me if you believe it or you don't. You weren't there. No, but at least I'm willing to admit it. <laughs> okay, we got our next two items uh, up for auction here. Uh, Mike, why don't you start us off? <laughs> uh, okay, thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, <clears throat> As you can see, uh, gentlemen, uh, this here is an authentic drive-in movie speaker. It dates all the way back to the 50s. Where'd you get that, Mike? At the Possum Lake uh, Drive-In Theater. You got that in the 50s? No, I got it on Saturday night. Uh, but it is old, yeah. and uh, there was a movie from the 50s playing at the time, uh, The Ten Commandments. <laughs> I guess you left before they got to Thou Shalt Not Steal, huh? Look, I know we all kid about my criminal record, but, Mr. Green, I'm actually a little hurt. Right. I did not steal this speaker. I just had to leave in a hurry, and I forgot it was still stuck in the window. <laughs> Honest. What was the big rush? Well, the car's owner came back from the snack bar. <laughs> well, well, we'll get to that item in a minute. Right now, let's see what uh, Hap brought for us. Oh, thank you, Red. I figure what this auction needs is a touch of celebrity. So I brought along something just a little bit special. Oh, man. That's a dance. That looks like something Elvis would wear, huh? Yeah, in his dreams, maybe. <laughs> no, well, I mean, well, who is the celebrity? I was. Huh? <laughs> I wore it to front my band in the late 50s, Hap Hornet and the Rockin' Drones. Oh, yeah, we had our own sound. I'm guessing Puget Sound. <laughs> no, no, no. We were very big. We had a gold record in 58. Got a lot of hotter water. <laughs> we toured all over the States. Did you ever meet the king? Who's that? Elvis. Elvis. Yeah. Elvis, nah. Yeah, well, I met him. But we hardly spoke. He opened for me in Fresno. <laughs> I would have been the king myself, but I was Canadian, so they called me the Prime Minister of Rock and Roll. So this was your jacket? Yeah, fans would go nuts when they saw me in that. I remember telling Anne Margaret I was too busy to see her. Broke her heart. To cheer her up, I suggested she go and show Elvis the ropes. I didn't mean literally. Boy, Ham, I don't know. You know, you as a rock star, I'm having trouble believing this. What do you think, Mike? Well, I think you should show a little more respect, Mr. Green. Oh, thanks, Mike. I right, take it from me. You can't toss off a whopper like that and keep a straight face, man. That's really hard. <laughs> Look, I don't care whether you guys believe me or not. I'm telling you, I was a rock star. Why else would a heterosexual guy wear a thing like that? <laughs> You know, other than about a week in October, I basically did nothing last year, and I, and I was fine with that. 
But even though I was doing nothing, my mind was still thinking about stuff. Stuff that I hadn't done and should have. Stuff that I had done and shouldn't have. But mainly it was coming up with a lot more evidence that, as far as I'm concerned, proves that I'm right and almost everybody else is wrong. And that was fine too. But where I made my mistake uh, was that I shared all that with my friends and especially my wife. And before you knew it, they were suggesting that I gather up all those opinions and stories and uh, take them on the road where they belong. I even went, uh, went to see my doctor to make sure I was healthy enough to tour again, and he gave me the go-ahead. He said I probably wouldn't get sick on the road, but even if I did, he'd prefer I was thousands of miles away when it happened. So I put together a brand new show, and I'm calling it uh, I'm Not Old, I'm Ripe. And we're going to be doing 20, about 25 cities, starting in St. Pete's, Florida on March the 30th, and we're going to end up in the middle of May somewhere out west. Uh, it's basically a, a lodge meeting. And if you want to find out where I'm going to be and when I'm going to be there, go to redgreen.com, click on the city that's nearest to you. I'm hoping you can all make it, or I'm hoping a few of you can make it. I think it's going to be uh, my best show yet, and if you saw the first two, you know that's certainly doable. So uh, looking forward to a successful tour. Otherwise, my friends and my wife are going to look like idiots. Uh, until then, uh, I hope, I'm hoping to see you uh, at the lodge meeting. And uh, in meanwhile, keep your stick on the ice. And now it's the last part of the show where we expose the three little words that men just find it so difficult to say. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are, my guests on the expert segment today. Of course, uh, my Uncle Red and... <laughs> Hap Shaughnessy. Here's letter number one. Dear experts, Although I have a degree in both economics and political science and have won many friendly games of I'm way smarter than you are, I have never really understood how computers work. Can you explain? <laughs> huh? No, go ahead. <clears throat> well, uh, well, a computer is a very simple thing. Yeah, there's nothing to it. <laughs> yeah, uh, mainly you have uh, your computer programs which are on the disks, and the disks go into the computer, and they're, they're spun around there by a, a type of electric drill. <laughs> and that's flying around in there so that your software high-density database units come spinning right off the disk and ram right up against your TV screen. <laughs> and that allows you to print stuff off, and you can get graphs, which will show you exactly how much money you're going to lose next year. <laughs> Yeah, well, I better clarify that a bit, I think. Uh, to do that, I'd have to go back as far as the, the old Morse code that I used during WW2 when I had to let my squad know that I captured this enemy battalion single-handedly. <laughs> I'd have to decline the medal because there wasn't enough room left on the tunic anymore. It was disappearing over the shoulder. But uh, where Morse code was dots and dashes, computers are ones and zeros. Or, uh, Bits and bytes of I's and BM's. <laughs> and, they got, uh, and they got this little uh, Japanese uh, a robot inside the CPU, and he's going like that to beat the band. <laughs> okay, it's that time of the show where we examine those three little words that men find so hard to say. I don't know! Excellent. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, th oh, this week joining us on the expert report of the show is my Uncle Red and, of course, his best friend, Mr. Hap Shaughnessy. Yeah. All right. And today's letter goes as follows. Dear experts, huh? my husband is a nice enough guy in his own way. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be in anyone else's way. <laughs> now he's just in the way. <laughs> when I look at my children, I wonder how much of a person's appearance, personality, and destiny is inherited in their genes. None, nothing. none whatsoever. None. It's a myth. No, no, it's a myth is no, what it is. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> sure, you can, you can inherit appearance and not your destiny. If that could be inherited, why aren't I the king of Russia? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, this letter, is it not written by your wife, is it, Mr. Shaughnessy? No. <laughs> I'm talking about inheriting my family business as Tsar of Russia. Come on, Red. You met my mother. Yeah, I met her once. She was running a chip wagon in Port Asbestos. 
Before that, she was sole surviving daughter of the Romanov family. Her name was Anne. Anne, short for Anastasia. <laughs> about this in school. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When the Russians came in, you know, and, and the, the communists, they just took over and they killed the Russian family, the royal family and everything, and they said maybe there's even one daughter still surviving. That's right. Tsar Nicholas, or as I used to call him, Grandpa Nick. <laughs> <laughs> he hid my mom in a large Fabergé egg. <laughs> and uh, a good member a good member of the family, a good friend of the family, Rasputin, uh, he, mailed, he mailed her to France. <laughs> All right? And she was brought up in Paris. She even had a, a short fling with Ernest Hemingway. The writer Ernest Hemingway? So, pregnant with me, she emigrated to Canada, and she started up a chip wagon in Port Espestas. <laughs> Until the day she died, she couldn't uh, stand to have Russian dressing on her salad. <laughs> Brought back too many, too many painful memories. Did your mother tell you that story that you have? Yeah, every word of it. Well, there you are, Harold. Some personality traits are inherited. <laughs>
Uh, hey everybody, um, I've been doing this tour, I did it last year called I'm Not Old, I'm Ripe, and it's almost over. I'm going to do maybe seven or eight more dates. They're all going to be in America, some on the East Coast, some Midwest, and so on. They're not all together arranged yet, but some of them are. Like, I've got four of them are on sale now. I think one's in uh, Shipshawana, Indiana, one's in Des Moines, Iowa, one's in Frederick, Maryland, and the other one's in Virgins, Vermont. And like I say, there'll be three or four more coming. Go to redgreen.com and check the details. This will be the end of this tour. If you haven't seen it, um, it's it's pretty good. I've I've been to almost all the shows and they're and they're, and they're pretty good. So hopefully I'll see you down the road. Take it easy. All right, uh, welcome to Autobiography, where members of Possum Lodge talk about the cars that have meant something to them over the years. Uh, Hap, uh, what would you say was your favorite car over the years? Oh, oh, oh my! I'd have to say my '62 Aston Martin DBS Gold Finish. <laughs> Beautiful machine. Wow, that sounds just like the car James Bond drove before he was Roger Moore or Timothy Dalton or Pierce Bronson or that old guy. I can never remember his name. <laughs> it was the car, Harold. I owned the car that was in those movies. Oh, well, you bought that from the movie producers, did you? No, they bought it from me. <laughs> <laughs> they needed an Aston Martin and they knew that mine had machine guns and a bulletproof shield. <laughs> And revolving license plates and ejection seat and that thing that, that came out of the wheel, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and that was it. End of story. Now this whole story is kind of wah, wah, wah. <laughs> you tell me you used all those gadgets? <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> you kidding? <laughs> no, I never used the revolving license plates. <laughs> but those machine guns came in handy more than once. And if it wasn't for the bulletproof shield, well, I wouldn't be here now. No, no, when you have those things, you use them. Yeah, I could go for an ejection seat right about now. <laughs> or a cyanide capsule. <laughs> this was a business car, was it, Hal? Well, yeah. Yeah, kind of. I mean, come on, you knew I was in Her Majesty's Secret Service. Oh, yeah, right. Double O nothing, licensed to bull. <laughs> Oh, oh, beautiful car though, Red. Yeah. Uh, had a built-in bar and a spy camera, satellite locator, even a lie detector. Boy, it must have drained the battery every time you open your mouth. <laughs> all right, here we are all set for our big portage race. And the it's now time to feature those three little words that men find so hard to say. I don't know! <laughs> okay. Now, and to join my Uncle Red on the expert portion of the program is his best friend in the whole wide room, Mr. Hap Shaughnessy. <laughs> okay. Dear experts, is it true that basketball was invented by a Canadian? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. Basketball was invented by a Canadian, but he was living in the United States at the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was in the States. <laughs> But I didn't give up my Canadian citizenship. No, I was down there doing some hush-hush work for the CIA, as was then known as Teddy's Rough Riders. <laughs> they wanted me to come up with some sort of cover story as to what I did for a living, and I said, sports inventor. <laughs> and to make, uh, to, make, to make the cover a bit more uh, convincing, of course, mm -hmm. wouldn't you know, yeah. I had to invent a sport. <laughs> I sure didn't expect that darn game to catch on. Uh, you don't expect us to believe that, do you? Well... Huh? <laughs> 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 uh, you got me there! <laughs> no, 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 that wasn't true. No, I, yeah. I sure did expect that darn game to catch on. <laughs> Mr. Shaughnessy, out of all the history books I've ever read, all of them, they say the Canadian was Mr. James Naismith. James Naismith. Yeah, that was my CIA cover name. Funny you never mentioned that, Hap. You know, it's not like you to hold back. Well, I know, Red, but uh, all my spy work was top secret, you know. The only reason I can mention this now is because Franco is dead. <laughs> and, 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 and Spain is no longer a threat to world peace. I'm finding this very hard to believe. That's because you're listening. <laughs> I'm telling you, I invented basketball. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hoop dreams. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. Oh. Maybe, maybe Hap's right. Remember that time he was up on the drunken disorderly? Huh? Dribbling all over the court? 
<laughs> hey, Red Green here. If you've ever wanted to see me live, or see if I still was alive, I'm doing a brand new one-man show, and this could be it. In fact, I'm calling the tour. This could be it. I'll be doing a U.S. tour in the spring and Canada in the fall. It's a 90-minute family-friendly live lodge meeting. To find out where I'm going to be and when I'm going to be there, go to redgreen.com and follow the links. Hopefully, I will see you on the road. Meanwhile, keep your stick on the ice.